Such was the house, the household, and the business Mr. Verloc left behind him on his way westward at the hour of half-past ten in the morning. It was unusually early for him. His whole person exhaled the charm of almost dewy freshness. He wore his blue cloth overcoat unbuttoned. His boots were shiny, his cheeks, freshly shaven, had a sort of gloss, and even his heavy, lidded eyes, refreshed by a night of peaceful slumber, sent out glances of comparative alertness. Through the park railings, these glances beheld men and women riding in the row, couples cantering past harmoniously, others advancing sedately at a walk, loitering groups of three or four, solitary horsemen looking unsociable, and solitary women followed at a long distance by a groom with a cockade to his hat and a leather belt over his tight fitting coat. Carriages went bowling by, mostly two-horse brohams, with here and there a Victoria, with the skin of some wild beast inside and a woman's face and hat emerging above the folded hood, and a peculiarly London sun, against which nothing could be said except that it looked bloodshot glorified all this by its stare. It hung at a moderate elevation above Hyde Park Corner, with an air of punctual and benign vigilance. The very pavement under Mr. Verloc's feet had an old gold tinge in that diffused light in which neither wall, nor tree, nor beast, nor man cast a shadow. Mr. Verloc was going westward, through a town without shadows, in an atmosphere of powdered old gold. There were red, coppery gleams on the roofs of houses, on the corners of walls, on the panels of carriages, on the very coats of the horses, and on the broad back of Mr. Verloc's overcoat where they produced a dull effect of rustiness. Mr. Verloc was not in the least conscious of having got rusty. He surveyed through the park railings the evidences of the town's opulence and luxury with an approving eye. All these people had to be protected. Protection is the first necessity of opulence and luxury. They had to be protected, and their horses carriages, houses, servants had to be protected, and the source of their wealth had to be protected, and the heart of the city, and the heart of the country, the whole social order, favorable to their hygienic idealness, had to be protected against the shallow enviousness of unhygienic labor. It had to, and Mr. Verloc would have rubbed his hands with satisfaction had he not been constitutionally averse from every superfluous exertion. His idleness was not hygienic, but it suited him very well. He was in a manner devoted to it, with a sort of inert fanaticism, or perhaps rather with a fanatical inertness. Born of industrious parents, for a life of toil, he had embraced indolence from an impulse as profound, as inexplicable, and as imperious as the impulse which directs a man's preference for one particular woman in a given thousand. He was too lazy even for a mere demagogue, for a workman orator, for a leader of labor. It was too much trouble. He required a more perfect form of ease. Or it might have been that he was the victim of a philosophical unbelief in the effectiveness of every human effort. Such a form of indolence requires, implies, a certain amount of intelligence. Mr. Verloc was not devoid of intelligence, and at the notion of a menaced social order 
he would perhaps have winked to himself if there had not been an effort to make in that sign of skepticism. His big, prominent eyes were not well adapted to winking. They were rather of the sort that closes solemnly in slumber with majestic effect. Undemonstrative and burly in a fat pig style, Mr. Burlock, without either rubbing his hands with satisfaction or winking skeptically at his thoughts, proceeded on his way. He trod the pavement heavily with his shiny boots, and his general get-up was that of a well-to-do mechanic in business for himself. He might have been anything from a picture frame maker to a locksmith, an employer of labor in a small way. But there was also about him an indescribable air, which no mechanic could have acquired in the practice of his handicraft, however dishonestly exercised. The air common to men who live on the vices, the follies, or the baser fears of mankind, the air of moral nihilism, common to keepers of gambling hells and disorderly houses, to private detectives and inquiry agents, to drink sellers, and, should I say, to the sellers of invigorating electric belts, and to the inventors of patent medicines. But of that last I am not sure, not having carried my investigation so far into the depths. For all I know, the expression of these last may be perfectly diabolical. I shouldn't be surprised. What I want to affirm is that Mr. Verloc's expression was by no means diabolic. Before reaching Knightsbridge, Mr. Verloc took a turn to the left out of the busy main thoroughfare, uproarious with the traffic of swaying omnibuses and trotting vans, and the almost silent, swift flow of hansoms. Under his hat, worn with a slight backward tilt, his hair had been carefully brushed into respectful sleekness, for his business was with an embassy. And Mr. Verloc, steady like a rock, a soft kind of rock, marched now along a street which could, with every propriety, be described as private. In its breadth, emptiness, and extent, it had the majesty of inorganic nature, of matter that never dies. The only reminder of mortality was a doctor's broham, arrested in august solitude close to the curbstone. The polished knockers of the doors gleamed as far as the eye could reach. The clean windows shone with a dark, opaque luster. And all was still. But a milk cart rattled noisily across the distant perspective. A butcher boy driving with the noble recklessness of a charioteer at Olympic Games, dashed round the corner, sitting high above a pair of red wheels. A guilty-looking cat, issuing from under the stones, ran for a while in front of Mr. Verloc, then dived into another basement, and a thick police constable, looking a stranger to every emotion, as if he, too, were part of an inorganic nature, surging apparently out of a lamp post, took not the slightest notice of Mr. Verloc. With a turn to the left, Mr. Verloc pursued his way along a narrow street, by the side of a yellow wall, which, for some inscrutable reason, had number one Chesham Square written on it in black letters. Chesham Square was at least sixty yards away, and Mr. Verloc, 
cosmopolitan enough not to be deceived by London's topographical mysteries, held on steadily, without a sign of surprise or indignation. At last, with business-like persistency, he reached the square, and made diagonally for the number ten. This belonged to an imposing carriage gate in a high, clean wall between two houses, of which one, rationally enough, bore the number nine, and the other was numbered thirty-seven. But the fact that this last belonged to Port Hill Street, a street well known in the neighborhood, was proclaimed by an inscription placed above the ground floor windows by whatever highly efficient authority is charged with the duty of keeping track of London's strayed houses. Why powers are not asked of Parliament, a short act would do, for compelling those edifices to return where they belong is one of the mysteries of municipal administration. Mr. Verloc did not trouble his head about it, his mission in life being the protection of the social mechanism, not its perfectionment, or even its criticism. It was so early that the porter of the embassy issued hurriedly out of the lodge, still struggling with the left sleeve of his livery coat. His waistcoat was red, and he wore knee breeches, but his aspect was flustered. Mr. Verloc, aware of the rush on his flank, drove it off by simply holding out an envelope, stamped with the arms of the embassy, and passed on. He produced the same talisman also to the footman who opened the door and stood back to let him enter the hall. A clear fire burned in a tall fireplace, and an elderly man, standing with his back to it, in evening dress, and with a chain round his neck, glanced up from the newspaper he was holding, spread out in both hands before his calm and severe face. He didn't move, but another lackey, in brown trousers and claw-hammer coat edged with thin yellow cord, approaching Mr. Verloc, listened to the murmur of his name, and turning round on his heel in silence, began to walk, without looking back once. Mr. Verloc thus led along a ground-floor passage to the left of the great carpeted staircase, was suddenly motioned to enter a quiet small room, furnished with a heavy writing-table and a few chairs. The servant shut the door, and Mr. Verloc remained alone. He did not take a seat. With his hat and stick held in one hand, he glanced about, passing his other podgy hand over his uncovered sleek head. Another door opened noiselessly, and Mr. Verloc, immobilizing his glance in that direction, saw at first only black clothes, the bald top of a head, and a drooping dark gray whisker on each side of a pair of wrinkled hands. The person who had entered was holding a batch of papers before his eyes, and walked up to the table with a rather mincing step, turning the papers over the while. Privy Councillor Wormped, Chancellor d'Ambassade, was rather short-sighted. This meritorious official, laying the papers on the table, disclosed a face of pasty complexion and of melancholy ugliness, surrounded by a lot of fine, long, dark, gray hairs, bared heavily by thick and bushy eyebrows. He put on a black-framed pin's nose upon a blunt and shapeless nose, and seemed struck by Mr. Verloc's appearance. Under the enormous eyebrows, his weak eyes blinked pathetically through the glasses. He made no sign of greeting, 
neither did Mr. Verloc, who certainly knew his place. But a subtle change about the general outlines of his shoulders and back suggested a slight bending of Mr. Verloc's spine under the vast surface of his overcoat. The effect was of unobtrusive deference. I have here some of your reports, said the bureaucrat in an unexpectedly soft and weary voice, and pressing the tip of his forefinger on the papers with force, he paused, and Mr. Verloc, who had recognized his own handwriting very well, waited in an almost breathless silence. We are not very satisfied with the attitude of the police here, the other continued, with every appearance of mental fatigue. The shoulders of Mr. Verloc, without actually moving, suggested a shrug, and for the first time since he left home that morning, his lips opened. Every country has its police, he said philosophically, but as the official of the embassy went on blinking at him steadily, he felt constrained to add, allow me to observe that I have no means of action upon the police here. What is desired, said the man of papers, is the occurrence of something definite, which should stimulate their vigilance. That is within your province, is it not so? Mr. Verloc made no answer except by a sigh, which escaped him involuntarily, for instantly he tried to give his face a cheerful expression. The official blinked it doubtfully, as if affected by the dim light of the room. He repeated vaguely, the vigilance of the police and the severity of the magistrates, the general leniency of the judicial procedure here, and the utter absence of all repressive measures are a scandal to Europe. What is wished for just now is the accentuation of the unrest, of the fermentation which undoubtedly exists. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly, broke in Mr. Verloc in a deep deferential bass of an oratorical quality, so utterly different from the tone in which he had spoken before that his interlocutor remained profoundly surprised. It existed to a dangerous degree. My reports for the last twelve months make it sufficiently clear. Your reports for the last twelve months, State Councillor Wormpt began in his gentle and dispassionate tone, have been read by me. I failed to discover why you wrote them at all. A sad silence reigned for a time. Mr. Verloc seemed to have swallowed his tongue and the other gazed at the papers on the table fixedly. At last he gave them a slight push. The state of affairs you expose there is assumed to exist as the first condition of your employment. What is required at present is not writing, but the bringing to light of a distinct, significant fact, I would almost say of an alarming fact. I need not say that all my endeavors shall be directed to that end, Mr. Verloc said, with convinced modulations in his conversational husky tone, but the sense of being blinked at watchfully behind the blind glitter of these eyeglasses on the other side of the table disconcerted him. He stopped short with a gesture of absolute devotion, the useful, hard-working, if obscure member of the embassy, had an air of being impressed by some newly born thought. You are very corpulent, he said. This observation, really of a psychological nature, and advanced with the modest hesitation of an office man more familiar with ink and paper than with the requirements of active life, stung Mr. Verloc in the manner of a rude personal remark. He stepped back a pace. Eh? What were you pleased to say? He exclaimed with husky resentment. 
the Chancellor d'Ambassade, entrusted with the conduct of this interview, seemed to find it too much for him. I think he said that they had better see Mr. Vladimir. Yes, decidedly I think you ought to see Mr. Vladimir. Be good enough to wait here, he added and went on with mincing steps. At once Mr. Verloc passed his hand over his hair. A slight perspiration had broken out on his forehead. He let the air escape from his pursed up lips like a man blowing at a spoonful of hot soup. But when the servant in brown appeared at the door silently, Mr. Verloc had not moved an inch from the place he had occupied throughout the interview. He remained motionless, as if feeling himself surrounded by pitfalls. He walked along a passage lighted by a lonely gas jet, then up a flight of winding stairs and through a glazed and cheerful corridor on the first floor. The footman threw open a door and stood aside. The feet of Mr. Verloc felt a thick carpet. The room was large with three windows, and a young man with a shaven big face sitting in a roomy armchair before a vast mahogany writing table said in French to the Chancelier d'Ambassade, who was going out with the papers in his hand, he's fat, the animal. Mr. Vladimir, first secretary, had a drawing room reputation as an agreeable and entertaining man. He was something of a favorite in society. His wit consisted in discovering droll connections between incongruous ideas, and when talking in that strain, he sat well forward of his seat, with his left hand raised, as if exhibiting his funny demonstrations between the thumb and forefinger, while his round and clean-shaven face wore an expression of merry perplexity. But there was no trace of merriment or perplexity in the way he looked at Mr. Verloc. Lying far back in the deep armchair, with squarely spread elbows, and throwing one leg over a thick knee, he had with his smooth and rosy countenance the air of a preternaturally thriving baby that will not stand nonsense from anybody. You understand French, I suppose, he said. Mr. Verloc stated huskily that he did. His whole vast bulk had a forward inclination. He stood on the carpet in the middle of the room, clutching his hat and stick in one hand. The other hung lifelessly by his side. He muttered unobtrusively somewhere, deep down in his throat, something about having done his military service in the French artillery. At once, with contemptuous perversity, Mr. Vladimir changed the language and began to speak idiomatic English without the slightest trace of a foreign accent. Ah, yes, of course. Let's see. How much did you get for obtaining the design of the improved breech block of their new field gun. Five years rigorous confinement in a fortress, Mr. Verloc answered unexpectedly, but without any sign of feeling. You got off easily, was Mr. Vladimir's comment. And anyhow, it served you right for letting yourself get caught. What made you go in for that sort of thing, eh? Mr. Verloc's husky conversational voice was heard speaking of youth, of a fatal infatuation for an unworthy. Aha! Churches la femme! Mr. Vladimir deigned to interrupt, unbending, but without affability. There was, on the contrary, a touch of grimness in his condescension. How long have you been employed by the embassy here? he asked. Ever since the time of the late Baron Stott Wartheim, 
Mr. Verloc answered in subdued tones, and protruding his lips sadly in sign of sorrow for the deceased diplomat. The first secretary observed this play of physiognomy steadily. Ah, ever since, well, what have you got to say for yourself? he asked sharply. Mr. Verloc answered with some surprise that he was not aware of having anything special to say. He had been summoned by a letter, and he plunged his hand busily into the side pocket of his overcoat. But before the mocking, cynical watchfulness of Mr. Vladimir concluded to leave it there. Bah, said the latter, what do you mean by getting out of condition like this? You haven't got even the physique of your profession. You, a member of a starving proletariat, never. You, a desperate socialist or anarchist, which is it? Anarchist stated Mr. Verloc in a deadened tone. Bosh, went on Mr. Vladimir, without raising his voice. You startled old Wormt himself. You wouldn't deceive an idiot. They are all that, by the by, but you seem to me simply impossible. So you began your connection with us by stealing the French gun designs, and you got yourself caught. That must have been very disagreeable to our government. You don't seem to be very smart. Mr. Verloc tried to exculpate himself huskily. As I've had occasion to observe before, a fatal infatuation for an unworthy... Mr. Vladimir raised a large, white, plump hand. Ah, yes, the unlucky attachment of your youth. She got hold of the money and then sold you to the police, eh? The doleful exchange in Mr. Verloc's physiognomy, the momentary drooping of his whole person, confessed that such was the regrettable case. Mr. Vladimir's hand clasped the ankle reposing on his knee. The sock was of dark blue silk. You see, that was not very clever of you. Perhaps you are too susceptible. Mr. Verloc intimated in a throaty, veiled murmur that he was no longer young. Oh, that's a failing which age does not cure, Mr. Vladimir remarked with sinister familiarity. But no, you are too fat for that. You could not have come to look like this if you had been at all susceptible. I'll tell you what I think is the matter. You are a lazy fellow. How long have you been drawing pay from this embassy? Eleven years, was the answer, after a moment of sulky hesitation. I've been charged with several missions to London, while His Excellency, Baron Stott Vartheim, was still ambassador in Paris. Then, by His Excellency's instructions, I settled down in London. I am English. You are, are you, eh? A natural-born British subject, Mr. Verloc said stolidly, but my father was French, and so... Never mind explaining, interrupted the other. I dare say you could have been legally a Marshal of France and a Member of Parliament in England, and then, indeed, you would have been of some use to our embassy. This flight of fancy provoked something like a faint smile on Mr. Verloc's face. Mr. Vladimir retained an imperturbable gravity. But as I've said, you are a lazy fellow. You don't use your opportunities. In the time of Baron Stott the Varthein, we had a lot of soft-headed people running this embassy. They caused fellows of your sort to form a false conception of the nature of a secret service fund. It is my business to correct this misapprehension by telling you what the service is not. It is not a philanthropic institution. I've had you called here on purpose to tell you this.